Uh, I'm Rick Nelson, AASHTO SciCop coordinator, and welcome to today's webinar, the third in a series of showcasing the use of technology in achieving the maintenance mission. This webinar is brought to you by SciCop, the Snow and Ice Cooperative Program, AASHTO's Winter Maintenance Technical Service Program, and the Maintenance Operations Technical Working Group of AASHTO's Committee on Maintenance. State showcase reports are the most popular element of the National Winter Maintenance Peer Exchanges that are held every four years, or excuse me, every other year by Aurora Clear Roads and SICOP. While we're waiting for the next Winter Maintenance Peer Exchange, we created this series of webinars to help satisfy the desire to learn about how others are addressing the challenges of maintenance. I know you're asking yourself, when's the next Winter Maintenance Peer Exchange? Well, the dates have been set for September 21st to 23rd in 2020, and the venue will be Atlanta, Georgia. More information about that will come out later. If you missed any of our previous webinars showcasing maintenance technologies, you can find the full webinar recordings on the SciCop Talks Winter Ops webpage, along with all of our podcasts on winter maintenance related topics. And that address is www psychoptalkswinterops.com. <clears throat> For the next 60 minutes, our two presenters will brief you on their use of technology to address some unique challenges in their maintenance operations. But before we get started, I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and that the recordings will be available at a future date on the Psychop Talks Winter Ops webpage. There will be time for our presenters to respond to questions, so uh, if you'd like to uh, pose a question to our presenters, please use the chat pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen in the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Our first presenter today is Natalie Rourke and Travis Teeter from the Missouri DOT, and our second presenter will be Russ Bulk Bulkharts. Sorry, Russ. Okay, well, thank you, Rick. Again, my name is Natalie Roark. I'm the State Maintenance Director for MoDOT. And joining me today is Travis Teeter. He's a maintenance supervisor who has been directly involved in developing the device that we'll be discussing today. So first of all, just a little bit of the why that led to where we are today. In 2018, 13 people were killed in work zone crashes in Missouri. And between 2014 and 2018, there were a total of 3,248 injuries in our work zones. MoDOT knows that there must be constant improvement in both the planning and the technology that we employ in the field. The TMA flagger is an innovation by a team of employees in MoDOT's Kansas City District that combines a truck mounted attenuator or a TMA and an automated flagging assistance device or AFAD that completely removes the MoDOT employee flaggers from the roadway. It improves the safety of work zones for both the workers and the traveling public by allowing the flagging operations to be performed under the protection of a TMA. The development of the TMA flagger has been in the works since December of 2015, and after successful testing, MoDOT has issued a request for proposal hoping to purchase 44 TMA flaggers to be used across the state. There's some pretty scary statistics showing since 2015 that well over 100 MoDOT truck mounted attenuators have been hit in slow moving operations, resulting in dozens of injuries to MoDOT employees and more than a million dollars in damage. Distracted driving, aggressive driving, and increased traffic continue to pose more of a risk to employee safety every day. Every year, MoDOT celebrates a day of remembrance, honoring the 134 MoDOT fallen workers that Missouri has lost in our work zones. Sadly, we had the tragic loss of two flaggers in Missouri work zones in late 2015 and 2016, one being a MoDOT flagger and another being a contractor flagger. These two tragic events, one after the other, is what inspired the MoDOT maintenance workers to come up with a way to get flaggers off the road and out of traffic. I have a, a twin brother um, that works on a road crew. They were, they were doing guardrails. He called me one afternoon and said, hey, we, we, we lost our flagger. I said, what, what do you mean you lost your flagger? He said, it got ran over. You know, we got off the phone and, and, and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, wow, you know, that, 
That could have been somebody calling me, telling me. That could have been somebody calling me, telling me that my brother got ran over. So I didn't like, I don't like that feeling. You know, um, I, I don't ever want to have to see anybody lose their, lose their life doing the road work that we do. We start thinking outside the box and, and we, we jumble things around to try to come up with ways, what can we do to be safe so that we go home safe. So we put our heads together and came up with an innovation that we feel like will save lives. What we have here is what we call the, the TMA flagger or the TMA AFAD. Well, it's going to take our flaggers off the road to put them in a, in, a, in a protective vehicle so that they go home safe at the end of the day. We have the, the variable message board that will communicate to the traveling public. You have the, the stop and slow arms, which represents a flagger standing in the road with the, the stop and slow paddle. You have a red and yellow light on there to represent a traffic light. The slow pedal and the, the stop pedal both are also lit up with LED lights. You know, it's just a better way for us to do our job. Well, I think the, you know, the intention behind this is to, um, to honor the memory of a coworker that lost her life in, in service uh, to Missouri. Um, so, you know, someone um, operating on a flagger uh, activity, you're in harm's way. Uh, and what we're finding is that the distraction of the traveling public when they're utilizing uh, the roadways, we try to keep the roads open while we're working on them, but we have to do that safely to develop a technology that could be deployed so that we can reduce the human flagging activity. Uh, that's a goal of ours. Uh, we do not want to have people in harm's way. Well, the, the innovation challenge is really important to all the team members here at MoDOT because what it does is it gives them an opportunity uh, to bring their ideas forward, uh, to have them uh, through a competitive process uh, uh, reviewed by their peers uh, and looked at by the senior leadership in the organization and our commission. And the winners of those challenges uh, receive uh, investments into those innovations to be implemented. And uh, we've been trying to scale those up and deploy them throughout the organization so they can really see the impact of their idea um, actually increasing safety of their coworkers and themselves and the traveling public while they're doing their work. Good morning, this is Travis Teeter. Um, during the Day of Remembrance, we got the honor to meet the Epker family. Um, knowing while the family was in search for answers of what happened, of why they lost their loved one, we were working to find a solution to prevent anything like this from ever happening again, to save lives. Um, from, from soapstone to reality, um, after my brother's incident, we had, um, you know, I was, talking to my supervisor and told him I wanted to put a stop and slow pedal on a truck, keep the flagger in the truck. Um, we presented that idea to um, our superintendent. He told me to meet with Russ Fisher and had a similar idea. And he told us, you know, you guys can meet on the, on the next rain day. Um, since then, we, we found out about um, Lyndon Epker losing his life while flagging and we got we, we received a message that said this will not wait until the next rain day. We will meet first thing Monday morning, which we did. And um, I wanted to put the stop and slow pedal on the truck. Russ Fisher wanted to mount the traffic light on the truck. And David Epright said, there's no way they're going to let you sit in a truck without a TMA. And we said, fine, we'll, we'll mount it to a TMA, TMA. And then David said, you know, could replace the arrow board with a message board that has the picture and the word stop on it. Um, so from reality, from soapstone to reality is, is where we went from on there. 
so pictured on the slide is the original prototype developed by the team in early 2016. And as Travis said, it included a stop paddle, two indicator lights, red and yellow, and a flashing arrow panel. Overall, the TMA flagger improves safety in work zones by providing better direction to the traveling public. It protects the work area with the TMA and eliminates altogether the need to have a human flagger. So Travis and his team worked hand in hand with MoDOT's Highway Safety and Traffic Division and the Missouri Division Federal Highway Office to ensure that the TMA flagger met requirements for an automated flagger assistance device per the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices or the MUTCD. After review of the original prototype, the district modified the TMA flagger to include the matrix CMS board and then relocated the indicator lights above the stop and the slow paddle, red for stop and yellow for slow. The MUTCD required the indicator light to be within 24 inches of the stop sign. And then MoDOT also evaluated the addition of signs. The weight on stop sign is mandatory per MUTCD and the go on slow is optional. The Kansas City District had a pilot with the matrix board on an outer road with office employees. So we sent out an email letting the, the district know that we was gonna have this prototype set up on, on an outer road um, and, and invited everybody to come through and, and check it out. Um, one particular individual wanted to know what kept them from just driving around it. Um, I advised them to, to drive back through it again and I, I communicated with the operator of the TMA flagger and said and told them that this vehicle is going to come around you like it's not going to stop. Um, and I want you to, to indicate to them that they need to stop. So at that time, as they started by, the, the operator pushed the button, which activated the panic lights and uh, the, the sound of the air horn. Um, and then these individuals gave me the, the thumbs up like, OK, we, we understand now we need to stop. Um, how the CMS sign works, as shown, the changeable message sign alternates between an image of a stop sign and the word stop. Every two seconds during this stopped interval, the CMS alternates between an image of slow and the words go on slow every two seconds during the go interval. The AFAD was built onto a truck mounted attenuator, a TMA unit, in order to provide protection for the AFAD operator in the truck. The flagger in the in the truck controlled the signals by observing traffic at the end of work zone and communicating with another flagger at the other end of the work zone by radio. So as a result of the feedback that Travis said they received from employees testing it in the field, the district added a horn and the mandatory wait on stop sign was added per the MUTCD standards. MoDOT then invited Federal Highway to do a final review to ensure the TMA flagger met any of their concerns, and ultimately Federal Highway approved it and supported MoDOT moving forward. So now it was ready to be showcased in MoDOT's Innovations Challenge in 2017. So what exactly is the Innovations Challenge? The director discussed it a bit in the video, but MoDOT started this over 10 years ago in 2007 encouraging MoDOT employees to pitch their ideas to the annual Innovations Challenge. The goal is to improve the department's best practices and continually to challenge our employees to find ways to do their jobs safer and more efficient. Since the Innovations Challenge began in 2007, it has generated over 1,500 innovations, of which more than 250 of these are now MoDOT everyday best practices, just like the TMA flagger. Overall, the TMA flagger came out on top as a huge winner. It was the tool and equipment first round winner. It won the People's Choice Award and the Director's Safety Award. So before we moved forward with ordering a bunch of the units, MoDOT wanted to evaluate the overall effectiveness of the TMA flagger by a third party. So in 2017, we partnered with the University of Missouri Columbia to conduct a study of the TMA flagger. We wanted to observe the traveling public's reactions during real life conditions and determine if there were any opportunities for improvement and compare the effectiveness of a human flagger versus the TMA flagger. 
As part of the study, MoDOT also wanted to confirm the preference of the full color matrix CMS board because it was a higher cost ticket item. So we just wanted to make sure that it was worth the investment. The scope of the project included three different components. There was a field test with both a human flagger and a MoDOT flagger with the CMS. We did a simulator study both with and without the CMS. And then it was followed by a survey that captured driver preferences and the understanding of the TMA flagger. For, for the field study, video data was collected for two days in a work zone. One direction had a human flagger while the other direction had the MoDA APAC. The flagging methods were reversed on the second day. Driver behaviors at both ends of the AFAT and human flagger were recorded by cameras. The performance measures of vehicle approach speed, stop location, and first vehicle approach speed all favor the AFAT over the flagger. For the field survey, the research team distributed 104 hard copies and 182 online links to drivers after they drove through the work zone with the AFAT. A total of 42 responses were received. The MoDA APAD was preferred over the flagger by almost 80% of the participants. Over, over half of the respondents, 54%, preferred the AFAD much, much more than the flagger. Next in the simulator study using the University of Missouri's ZUSIM, four setups were evaluated. Human flagger, MoDA APAD, AFAD with alternative sign and AFAD without CMS. The driving simulator results showed that the MoDA AFAD significantly reduced average approach speeds by 8.4 miles an hour, increased full stop distance by 100, by, um, excuse me, by 44 feet, increased and increased the first brake location where participants reacted to the stop controls by 58 feet as compared to the human flagger. The simulator results indicated that the MoDA APAD performed better than the human flagger. So after successful testing, MoDOT was then ready to move forward with procurement for the purchase of 44 TMA flaggers to be used across the state. I'm happy to report that MoDOT is nearing the end of that procurement phase. We recently received two bids and awarded to both vendors. Each vendor is requested to provide MoDOT a prototype for review prior to moving forward with final approval and fabrication of additional units. The prototypes will be delivered within the next month, so we're super excited to see the final product. I'll have to admit there were certainly some growing pains throughout the procurement process, but overall MoDOT wanted to do our due diligence to ensure that the equipment was safe and certified. We learned that with any new technology, it's best to be less prescriptive in the specs and identify the minimum specs that we want in the final product. And we certainly know MoDOT's not in the business of mass production. So if we just provide the minimum prototype of what we need and allow some flexibility in the end product, this opens up an opportunity for further innovation and fresh ideas by the vendors. Additional benefits. Overall, the TMA flagger is adaptable to 24-7 operation. The system is good to go, night or day, just hook it up, plug it in, and hit the road. It can be used in all types of weather, extreme cold to extreme heat, and even various participation. Flaggers are protected in a climate-controlled truck cab, provide clear instruction to the traveling public in work zones, reducing or eliminating driver confusion, with the CMS, the motorist knows exactly what they need to do, such as stay left or proceed with caution. Better communication with other crew members. Crew members in the work area will be audibly warned in the event of an errant, errant vehicle enters the work area, and it eliminates employee fatigue while flying. Overall, the TMA flagger in this process has just been a huge success for MoDOT. The team of MoDOT employees received the Governor's Quality and Productivity Pinnacle Award that recognizes projects for customer service excellence, efficiency, innovation, process improvement, and employee ingenuity within the Missouri State Government. 
And then the team also received a Missouri State Employee Award of Distinction from the governor given to individuals or groups who go above and beyond their normal job duties in the categories of heroism, human relations, innovation, leadership, public service, and safety. So what an awesome honor, and I'm so proud and thankful for all the team's efforts. It was an honor to be recognized by our governor and receive these awards for this innovation. Knowing that the governor took time to not only acknowledge our efforts, but to personally give us these awards was truly a feeling of gratitude. Okay, well that concludes the information that we wanted to share with you today on the TMA flagger. Again, Missouri DOT appreciates the opportunity and now we will turn it back over to you, Rick. Thank you. All right, thank you, Natalie. I'd like to remind everybody to go ahead and pose your questions uh, in the chat box uh, there with the go to uh, webinar control panel. And uh, we'll answer all the questions at the end of the uh, at the end of Russ's presentation, I see that there's a, a a couple of questions coming in, so hopefully we'll have time to to deal with those at the end of Russ's presentation. So with that, Russ, uh, go ahead. All right, thanks, Rick. Uh, hopefully you guys can see my slide here. So, um, okay, I'm Russ Bukholz. I'm the uh, Strategy and Innovations Director for the DO, North Dakota DOT. I'm also the uh, UA, UAS, which stands for Unmanned Aircraft Systems uh, Program Administrator for the state. So with the integration pilot program, this was in effect uh, last May, so about a year and a half now, um, there was 10 selectees with that. Uh, of those, there was three DOTs, North Dakota, Kansas, and North Carolina. Um, also, you'll see where Lee County Mosquito Control District down in Fort Myers, Florida. Florida. Um, there, it's in red that they are no longer because um, they didn't have the resources. And this is, there is no dollars to this. This is basically all with all private partners um, everyone basically contributes on their own to this. So with that, uh, North Dakota is, I'll say, kind of the one of the luckier, lucky, luckier ones that we have a, a test site within our state, as well as Virginia and, um, and Alaska. Those are two other sites with on the IPP, but you can see as far as the those sites that help us on the operational side. So we're talking about waivers. So we got beyond visual line of sight, operations over move, moving people or and moving vehicles and night navigation. All these require waivers. So you are not allowed to do that under the Part 107, meaning if you're flying for your department that you need a Part 107, you are not no longer a hobbyist. So you can see there we have an Airbus on the upper left uh, basically controlling their, the drone through a computerized electronic means. And then we have a Phantom 4 at night navigation. And then we, we also have on our partners, we have CNN. Uh, we did a operations over people waiver on a tailgating event um, at the North Dakota State University football uh, parking lot area uh, last September. So as far as with the IPP, this is the, the whole uh, total of that is where I'm strictly talking under the Part 107 regulations. You can see everything's Part 107 dot and then it's like 0.29 is your night operations. That So in order to apply that, you need that 107.29 uh, night uh, operations waiver. And you can see all of those that were submitted, uh, 124, 124 total. And this is as of September 26th. And with that is with the nine entities that are uh, available that are working on this right now, uh, we have approximately have one more year to, to go. Uh, this is again, this on September 26th, this is uh, where the waivers and then also the authorizations to fly in certain airspace. So, what this is going to be a video of, of the tailgating event, and this is a Phantom 4, and we were able to fly that. It's a 3.14 3 pound unit, but it has a para zero parachute. So that uh, risk mitigation is taken care of with the parachute. In case something should fail, we can mitigate the risk by deploying the parachute. Along with that, we were able to fly these. We had our pilots on a canopy above, and you'll probably see it in the, in the video here shortly. Um, they were flying it, so they were in a, there you can see an upper right-hand corner there. Um, they were flying the drone at that location, so they were not bothered by anybody in the parking lot. And you can see this is a fairly windy event. And we also have public outreach tent and everything else. And that's inside of the stadium. 
So the next video what I'm going to show you is the it's Airbus flying the uh, Sensefly EB Plus. This is a two and a half pound aircraft. It's styrofoam, um, and we're flying in an urban environment. This is the first of I guess in the nation of us flying beyond visual line of sight in an urban environment by n not using uh, visual observers, but strictly by electronic means. So you can see when it's flying in the air, it almost just looks like a blackbird. Um, as far as public watching it, or I mean, really didn't have any concerns of us flying in that area. It's very quiet. The one thing with the EB Plus, when you la when it lands, you'll see that there's a, there's really no landing gear. It, it'll do a belly belly land on it. This aircraft alone is worth about twenty three thousand dollars. So you can see it's coming in. Okay, so as far as what the North Dakota Department of Transportation, so on, on June 24th, we submitted for a waiver um, flying a DJI Mavic 2, and you can see a picture on the bottom right. That is a Mavic 2 with a Parazero parachute on there. It's a safe air parachute. Um, so we have a four-year waiver, so we can do operations over people. Why it's important for the operations over people waiver? So if we have a disaster or a flooding event that we can fly you know, over the sandbaggers or fly over the uh, certain areas where people are involved, it still doesn't allow us to fly over moving vehicles, but it, it is just one next step toward, you know, moving into those situations where we can, we can fly legally in those areas. Uh, we were the first uh, DOT in the nation to receive this waiver, and as well as I think the 35th organization overall received that waiver. So, how were how were we able to basically acquire our aircraft? Uh, we were able to leverage our stick grants, um, our 2018 grants. We were able to purchase 12 Mavic 2s. Of those, we did the Zooms, the uh, Pro, as well as the Enterprise. And then now we're, we have the dollars left over. We're going to leverage the 2019 to purchase a LiDAR sensor unit. And this will be a mo more of a you know, multi-helicopter style uh, aircraft with that type of sensor on there, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. That is a Ranger Regal uh, type LiDAR de device. So who did we train and how, how did we distribute them? So we did train. Um, we have 19 pilots. Of those, we have three that were pilots for the DOT, um, you know, manned air aircraft. And then also, you can see as far as the divisions that we trained, uh, we did the, the kind of the boot camp training event, and then we allowed them to go get their Part 107. And you can see where we did put one in the maintenance division as well, construction and in those areas. And then also, we um, put some out in the districts, uh, kind of uh, where one, like Grand Forks, you can see where they're supporting Fargo and the other ones support each other the districts. So we have a total of eight districts, and then we also have our material and research will um, support our Bismarck district, and then ourselves, we, we support another district out west. Um, and what we did is we put the parachutes kind of strategically around, so communications and also the Grand Force districts as well as uh, my division, we have the parachute in case we need to fly in those certain events where we have personnel, uh, you know, basically bystanders around those areas. Okay. How does uh, DOT plan to use UAS in their operations? So um, emergency immediate response, survey work, infrastructure inspections, and then th there's a whole bunch of other opportunities where uh, we can do the, those type of things. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner, that's the Red River uh, flowing north into Canada, and the, that's Sorley Bridge, and that was this a spring event. So one is emergency response, and this is where the, your maintenance division comes in. Um, the first photo on the bottom left is I-29 uh, north of Grand Forks, and you can see the Red River is pretty much the, over its banks, and it's uh, getting close to coming over actually the interstate. Uh, at this point, it never did it, uh, but it has in the past. Um, we received 250,000 views on this on Facebook, as well as 1,600 shares. So it really gets out to the pub public on that, and it eliminates a lot of the calls. Uh, the other thing is, as over to the right, um, we had uh, you know, a snow event where we, if we need to look for certain personnel or whatever else, or just even check out the situation where the roads are impassable, we we're able to do that with the drones we have. The Enterprise um, DJI that we have has a heated battery so we can fly at colder conditions. So one thing is on survey work. So currently we have a Cessna uh, caravan with a Zeiss camera. The camera alone is, uh, was at the time when we purchased it about 13 years ago worth about a million dollars. 
Um, right now we're looking at is can we use the drone to basically complement what we have and probably in the future look at replacing it. So the right hand picture is um, XL Energies, there. it's a Vapor 55. It's a small UAS, 55 pounds and below, with uh, has the sensors that we were looking for in order for us to do LiDAR type of capability for survey work. The other thing is in, uh, infrastructure inspection. So on the bottom left, we have a snooper, basically looking over underneath the bridge. Uh, where we plan on using is using the drone where we can isolate the certain areas and inspect it. And you can inspect it uh, probably about a third of the cost, but also you can isolate those areas where you're not having lane closures and not putting your employees at risk. Um, and that way, with that, we can uh, do our bridge inspect inspections a lot faster and safer. And then at the bottom right, we have is um, a line slide that was prepared on I-94 near Valley City. And we're able to basically monitor the landslides and also kind of record what's going on and basically compare photos or videos. So other opportunities. Uh, on the bottom left is basically you've got high mass lighting. I mean, you can do your tower inspections. You can do a lot of things, um, whatever comes to mind with, uh, with certain type of drones. Um, they do handle well under the uh, conditions of wind speeds, especially the, the Mavic 2s. Um, they can go up to basically 30 miles an hour as far as wind conditions. Um, so they do perform fairly well. And then also you take a look at where we have stockpiles, either sand, salt, mixture of both, where you do a lot of measuring and you really need to know what the quantity, how much you use and how much you have remaining. You can do that a lot with using uh, your drone and then using certain software like MicroStation to basically give you that volume of what you have on hand. So the one thing I do want to mention is is that uh, reporting unsafe UAS, um, it's it's really a, one of those things that I, I'll say every person should know about is where you can and where you can't fly. And so if you're near an airport, you need to contact the air traffic control, they call it the ATC, or basically your local law enforcement. They know how to handle this situation. And then if you can record anything else. Um, the one thing is we want to basically have the cooperative and non-cooperative uh, people that are flying in the national airspace to have a safe airspace. And so that's what we want, we're trying to accomplish on the IPP side of the house, as well as when we fly, we wanna make sure that we're doing everything safely for our employees, as well as for the traveling public. And that ends my slide, so. So Rick, I guess it's all yours. All right, thanks Russ. Um, let me see here. Let's, uh... Hold on, we do have a couple of um, questions that we'd like to get to. Uh, so the first question is uh, with respect to the, uh, the TMA flagger. And uh, the question comes from Philip Anderley and it's, uh, is the TMA flagger MUTCD approved? Okay, uh, Philip, it's Natalie again with MoDOT. <clears throat> and overall, the um, with the MASH compliance, you, you asked about NUTCD. Yes, we did um, make sure that it was compliant with NUTCD, and that was all through the process and working with our Federal Highway Missouri Division Office. The um, MASH compliance definitely was challenging in itself, kind of where we're going with MASH compliance. Uh, beginning with January of 19. So the MoDOT self-certified the AFAD component separate from the TMA and the flashing arrow panel, but the trailer and the CMS board is compliant, but the additional pieces required our own self-certification. All right. Uh, the, the second question here is from uh, Steve. Uh, is there a warning system faced forward of the truck towards the workers, or is it just to the rear? Travis, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, it, 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 it's just facing the rear. The audible horns are facing the rear. Although I think you do have a, a horn system that the operator can, can deploy to warn folks in the work zone. Yes, the truck has the air horn on it that's facing forward, and then the, the air horn is on the TMA facing rearward. All right, and the, the third question is sort of a follow-on. <clears throat> is the information being presented today 
<clears throat> available via electronic documentation. Uh, MnDOT has a great interest in the TMA flagger. And, and I can say, uh, Steve, that uh, we're going to put the presentations along with the recording up on the website. And if there's any documentation uh, that's available, and I'll work through Natalie and uh, Travis and Russ, uh, we can provide links to that as well. So uh, their contact information will be there, so you can reach out to them directly. And things that are of general interest uh, will post up to the website. Uh, is, uh, is there uh, anything that uh, uh, you'd like to add to that, Natalie? Are there are there some reports available? Um, um, and that sort of thing? Yeah, we do have reports available. The University of Missouri study that was done, um, we have that report. And so there's documentation that we would be happy to share. All right. Uh, the next question uh, is for you, Russ. What type of software or hardware are needed to fly within or under structures, and does it require a different drone? And this is from Bob Vasek. Okay, good question. Uh, so it does, um, you need basically, I'll say, a, a camera that looks forward or up. Um, so it, it will require a certain type, uh, type of drone that's capable of doing that. Uh, the other thing is, as far as the control, the command and control of the aircraft, um, you're getting into areas where you're not going to have the uh, geo type of control where, you know, with the ISM type of radio. Um, so you need a, a different style of, of control. Uh, with those. The other thing is, is I know uh, Minnesota uses one that has a basket around it so it can bounce off or protect the blades. And that's the other thing you want to make sure that you, you're protecting your blades as far as it, in case something happens or you have a gust of wind that could carry you into the structure itself, um, you could lose your aircraft very easily. Um, I know some do a tethered one so they, in case that does happen, they can retrieve their aircraft. Um, Russ, I, I have a question for you. How long are your waivers good for? Uh, will there be some final reports, or, or how is the reporting out going to be, and, and how successful your uh, your pilot has been? Okay, as far as the waivers, it's a four-year waiver um, for us, um, but as far as our pilots, Part 107 licensing, that's a two-year type license, and you have to renew every two years. Um, with the IPP, we do quarterly and annual reports with that and we have one more year uh, it's a three-year program so we have one more year remaining within the IPP and and do you think uh, based on some favorable results uh, this uh, these kinds of applications may be rolled out to other uh, UAS uh, uh, states that use the UAS yes and, you know and that's what uh, for the operational over people waiver we were able to basically our goal is to make it repeatable and scalable to, to I'll say, pretty much anybody. So on the Operation Lower People Waiver, once we had received ours, we were able to give the law enforcement, so Burley County, as well as our Highwood Patrol, and now we're working with other law enforcement, you know, our Sheriff's Office, um, to get their Operations Over People Waiver, as well as their Night Navigation Waiver. Um, so that part is we're trying to make everything repeatable and scalable. Now, the, the going beyond visual line of sight, um, that's probably your larger partners on the private side, you know, your infrastructures uh, for pipeline inspections, your distribution, your transmission lines, all those type of things. Uh, you're going to need that type of aircraft in order to be productive. All right. Well, I want to extend uh, some sincere thanks to uh, Natalie and Travis and Russ uh, for sharing their use of technology and achieving their maintenance mission. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, state showcase webinar. Uh, the, again, the recordings will be available along with the contact information and any other general information uh, soon, and it will be on the PSYCOP Talks Winter Ops website. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we expect to have our fourth installment of uh, our technology showcase webinars around the January timeframe. We're trying to do them about every three to four months. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for your attention. And that concludes today's webinar.